They were now a small mafia, but they were on someone else's turf. He was a very, very scary man. Two poor boys from the struggling East End had become Britain's biggest gangsters. Their downfall had to come. How did the two of the biggest criminals of London come to hang out with Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland? In the 1950s, Ronnie and Reggie Cray were working class military deserters who dreamed of becoming boxers. By the 1960s, they were East End celebrities. David Bailey wanted to photograph them and they were invited for TV interviews. How much does this trial cost you? It's cost us roughly 8,000 pounds. And how do you feel about that? I don't suppose anyone likes the idea of spending that money for no reason at all, you know. But not everything was as it seemed. The Cray twins climbed the ranks of London society through arson, robbery, gambling, protection rackets, and even murder. Their fall was as quick as their rise when the London Metropolitan Police decided their notorious gang, The Firm, had to stop. Here's how the Cray twins became Britain's most notorious gangsters. Today's story begins in London's East End, where filth and poverty dominated people's lives for a long time. The streets were filled with factories, slaughterhouses, and tenement buildings, and the air was filled with smoke, and the streets were covered in various types of dirty liquids. The only types of fun in the 1950s East End were gambling and illegal nighttime workers. And of course, these only address the men. As always, the poorer areas are also the most ridden with crime, and the East End was no stranger to crime. The Radcliffe Highway murders and Jack the Ripper still sent fear through East Enders' veins, even by the 20th century. This is where Reggie and Ronnie Cray grew up. They were born on October 24th, 1933, 10 minutes apart, in Haggardston, East London. They were raised by their parents, Charles Sr. and Violet Annie, but also by their older brother, Charles, who was six years older than them. But Ronnie and Reggie were mostly raised by Violet, and the many women around her. I met this charming, lovely, kind, typical East End mother, who just happened to be the mother of the most notorious men in London. Charles Sr. was a traveling clothes trader, and in 1942, he ran off so as to not be drafted into World War II. Strangely, this would inspire his sons later on. Even though the twins were raised mostly by women, they always had a penchant for violence and disobeying authorities. They dropped out of school at age 15 and started working at Billingsgate Fish Market. This would be their first and last legitimate job. As teenagers, the twins revered their grandfather, Jimmy Cannonball Lee, who was a renowned boxer. So their dream was simple, following Jimmy's footsteps. Before long, Reggie did become a professional boxer. This is when, according to Charles, the difference between the twins became obvious. Reggie was calculated, rational, and wanted to perfect his skills. Ronnie was like a bull in a china shop. His violent tendencies outshadowed his desire to get better. This is why Reggie soon became the leader of the two. In 1952, Ronnie and Reggie were drafted into the British Army, as were many men between 17 and 21. But on their first day in training, they got into a heated argument and punched up their sergeant. This moment, as silly as it might sound, is a perfect indicator of the men they were going to become. Of course, the twins left the army right after beating up their training sergeant. But the next day, they were arrested and sent to the Tower of London. They were among the last ever prisoners to be held in that tower. During their two mandatory military service years, Ronnie and Reggie were in and out of prison, always getting into violent fights and doing exactly the opposite of what they were told. Needless to say, when this ended, they were dishonorably discharged. As a consequence, their boxing career was also a closed chapter. So they started thinking of other ways to make a good living. First, they borrowed money from Charles to lease a pool hall in Bethlehem Green, also in East London. This wasn't your average fancy London billiard club. It was a gathering spot for all the dodgy men the twins had befriended in prison and in the army. Soon enough, the club became storage for their friends' stolen goods. They were now a small mafia, but they were on someone else's turf. One day in the mid-1950s, the three dockers invited the Cray twins to their pub for a drink. The twins knew this wasn't a friendly invitation. The dockers were an infamous gang at the time, and they were upset the Crays were growing their business on their territory. 
But even though the brothers walked into a trap, they emerged victorious. The pub's landlord returned, expecting to find the brothers passed out. He found the Dockers unconscious on the floor, with Ronnie still punching one of them senseless. In 1956, the twins also entered the war between the top kingpins in East End, Billy Hill and Jack Spot Comer, fighting for Comer. This was the beginning of the Cray twins growing their gang and creating the notorious firm. How did they expand? It was a mixture of fear and respect. Respect because women and children, untouchable. Ordinary guys who went to work and they're untouchable. Any rows we had, it was only amongst ourselves. It was a pretty honorable rule for a violent gang that made money out of crime, but that was just a side of the firm. In 1956, Ronnie got up and shot a man for a very petty reason, shocking even his brother. He was a very, very scary man. Believe me, I had met a lot of scary people, but Ronnie Cray was a very, very sick, psychopathical, schizophrenia, and manic depressive, all rolled in one, in one word of his mouth. He meant everything he said. While his menacing figure could do wonders in the shady business the gang conducted, this was too much. It could easily start a gang war and turn everything into dust. But before he could do that, Ronnie was sent to prison. However, this was just the beginning of his turmoil. On Christmas Day, 1957, Reggie and Ronnie's aunt, Rose, died, and Ronnie had a severe mental breakdown. As a result of this, he was examined by prison psychiatrists and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. He was thus sent to the Long Grove Asylum near Epsom. But mental institutions are much laxer than prisons, so Reggie decided to get his brother out. What decided me to, 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 to get wrong away from Long Grove? Matthias and Epson was some of the stories he told me about the place. One day, he was sitting there eating an apple, and this nutter come along and smacked him in the eye, because he would tell you, it, just because he was eating an apple, because his place was full of nutters. So Reggie went inside the asylum, grabbed his distraught brother, and the two skedaddled, disregarding Ronnie's prison sentence completely. Now the Cray twins and the firm were out to conquer the world again. In the late 1950s, Reggie got his hands on his first West End bar, Emerald's Barn, as a deal to seal a conflict with a landlord. The deal seemed good, and Reggie made some profit at first, but in came Ronnie. They took the East End to, to Knightsbridge, it, you know, all them ugly looking bastards with their cuts down their faces and all that, and, and uh, flat noses, and they should have left the club as it was and run it as, and, without it, and just sat back and, and got the, collected the debts that was owed. That's all they needed to do. But of course they ruined the place, like they ruined every thing, you know. This was a problem. Reggie used threats too, but Ronnie simply took his methods to the extreme. And then there was his paranoia too. I'd see people laughing and having a good time five minutes before he walked through the door. The minute he walked through the door, that laughter stopped. The conversation dimmed. People were terrified that he would say, are you laughing at me? And then he had that paranoid feeling that they were laughing at him, and then there'd be a bloodbath. It might sound like the beginning of the end for the craze, but in 1960, they were just getting started. The firm was a huge business, and the craze's older brother, Charles, was also a valuable member and a guide to Reggie. Whether it was armed robbery, protection rackets, or simply gambling, Reggie and Ronnie were pulling all the strings of the mafia world to rise to the top. When things were at their peak, Reggie opened the Double RR Club on Bell Road. This was the beginning of Cray Brothers getting friendly with the big stars. By now, they were seen as the fancy nightclub owners on the swinging London scene. First, Charles had a fling with a famous actress, Barbara Windsor. Then came all the stars, Judy Garland, Shirley Bassey, and Frank Sinatra passed through their clubs, sharing drinks or jokes with the gangsters. When this wasn't happening, famed photographer David Bailey was immortalizing the brothers as two interesting characters from the London scene. This was the top of the mountain for the twins, as Ronnie would write in his autobiography. Now, 
two poor boys from the struggling East End had become Britain's biggest gangsters. But the 1960s would be a real roller coaster for the Cray twins. By the end of the decade, Reggie and Ronnie would be behind bars. In 1960, the Betting and Gambling Act was passed, legalizing various forms of gambling in the UK. This was a gold mine for the Crays. At the same time, the firm would collect tributes from dozens of businesses in London. The early 1960s brought fame and fortune to the Crays, but by now, they were stars, which meant the tabloids were very curious about their personal lives. Both Reggie and Ronnie were bisexual, although Reggie kept it more secret until his death. But in 1960s, conservative Britain, Ronnie's relationship became quite the scandal, especially in 1964, after a member of the House of Lords, Lord Boothby, was caught to be involved in an affair with Ronnie. However, Boothby and the twins threatened the newspaper in a submission. But in the 1960s, the Cray were having much bigger problems than tabloid conflicts. They were in an all-out war with the Richardson's gang, going head-to-head -head over the same rackets. The Richardson brothers and mad Frankie Frazier were feared men with a horrifying reputation, but the Cray twins were out to win the war. On March 8, 1966, the two gangs clashed at Mr. Smith's club. The Richardson brothers were seriously injured, but the Cray's man was injured. This was just the beginning of an even bloodier war. A few days later, the Richardson's man, George Cornell, visited the brothers in the hospital. Then he stopped for a drink at the Blind Beggar in Whitechapel. The Crays, who were drinking just a few doors down, were notified Cornell was close by. Ronnie got to the Blind Beggar within minutes and shot Cornell in the head. Cornell said, look who's here. But Ronnie didn't answer. He pulled out a Luger and shot Cornell through the forehead. This was the beginning of the Cray twins' downfall, but it wouldn't be a quick one. As of 1966, they were still untouchable. They owned the police and pretty much every official institution in London. But after Ronnie committed the gruesome murder in front of dozens of scared people, the Met Police knew they had to build a case against the Crays and dissolve the firm for good. A year later, they got the perfect opportunity. Reggie's wife took her own life, so he became as unstable and as violent as his twin brother. In 1967, Reggie killed a man, Jack the Hat McFitty. Ronnie had been pressing his brother to commit the final act too. He was frustrated that he had to be the mad dog every time, and his brother never took responsibility for the killing. But this would be a pretty gruesome one. Reggie's gun jammed, so he jumped on McFitty and punched him and stabbed him until he was finally dead. But I took him across and dumped him right on my fucking doorstep around the corner from my pub and left him there in the, in the back of a car. It was Reggie's first and final murder, and it was also the last straw for Scotland Yard. By May 1968, several firm members had given testimonies against the brothers. Because McVitty was part of the firm, they feared the Cray twins could kill them too. So they wanted out. In 1969, Ronnie and Reggie were arrested and charged with first degree murder. They were sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years before parole. This was the longest sentence given for murder in the UK at the time. After serving a few years in prison, the brothers were separated as Ronnie's schizophrenia was spiraling out of control. He thus spent his last 16 years at the Broadmoor Hospital, dying from a heart attack in March 1995. Reggie was released in August 2000 on compassionate grounds. He had terminal cancer and he was allowed to live the last five weeks in freedom. Ronnie and Reggie Cray climbed the social ladder as well as the gangster one with impressive speed, cunning, and determination. But as their methods grew more and more questionable, their downfall had to come. Still, they remain to this day, Britain's most notorious gangsters. Hey, thanks for watching. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. See you next time.